Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Bitter, and today I have a listener topic episode for you. So the three topics that I grouped together for this one include training for courses with climbing and descending, both with and without access to course-specific terrain. The actual question that was submitted had to do with training for trail races that have climbing and descending, but they don't have access to that type of training in their local running setup. So they were inquiring about whether like a stair stepper would be a a, a tool that would be useful for something like this. So I just kind of expanded the question to include uh, the entirety of preparing for trail courses that have a component of climbing and descending in it just to hopefully include some other people who maybe are thinking along the same lines but do have access to some course specific terrain. Second question is testing your fitness throughout a training plan. So the exact question was asking about how often you should baseline your fitness with tests throughout a training plan. So similar to the first one, I'm going to kind of branch it out just a little bit and just kind of talk about just the whole concept of baselining your fitness in order to properly set yourself up for the right types of workouts, as well as how you can maybe monitor status check that throughout the training plan itself. Finally, the third question is how to fuel for high mileage training to avoid gastrointestinal issues, especially if feeling hungry and bloated. So that one I stuck a little more true to form in terms of the question. The specific question I think was just basically increasing high mi- or increasing mileage in training, constantly hungry and bloated at the same time. How do I eat or what do I eat to maybe help minimize that sort of stuff? So I jumped into just kind of describing some of the ways that I would kind of uh, look at this and then potentially problem solve depending on where the person is at, whether they're getting into this and they're anticipating that sort of a situation occurring or if they've had those experiences in the past. Awesome. So those are the questions that we have for today's episode. If you have questions or topics that are either add-ons to the ones that we're covering today or on previous Q&A topic-based episodes, feel free to send those to me. Or if you have original ones that you're just curious in and you want me to weigh in on, feel free to reach out to me and send those over. I will add them to the list and cover them in a future episode like this one. You can do that by shooting me an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com or reaching out to me on my social media channels, which are at Zach Bitter for Instagram, at Z Bitter for Twitter, and at Z Bitter Endurance on Facebook. You can also head over to my website, which is just ZachBitter.com, and there is a contact form there as well. Alrighty, before we get rolling with these questions and topics, just a couple announcements. Uh, there is a group run in Austin, Texas that I help manage. It's called the Outliers ATX Group Run. I partnered with Alpha 180 to put this together. So we have an all-comer setup where there are options currently for a six-mile loop, a four-mile loop, and a two-and-a-half-mile out and back that is usually a run-walk setup. We actually just recently added two start times. So if you are looking to go a little further than any of those distances, you can actually attend both of them or pick your time that works best for you. So we have an 8 a.m. and a 9 a.m. start on Sunday mornings. We meet at Metz Park. You will want to check out Outliers ATX on Instagram for any updates and details about specifics. Usually what we've been doing is we'll start that 8 o'clock one. We'll do a run from there. And then uh, I'll do a quick little clinic, usually between 5 to 10 minutes long, on topics that are of interest to the group members. And then we head out for that second run uh, at 9 a.m. Typically, the 9 a.m. one has, has more people there. So if you're interested in a little bit of a larger group, that's probably the one to target if the time frame is not of any issue to you. Otherwise, if you're looking for a little bit of a smaller group, 8 a.m. might be a good one for you for those purposes. But like I said, if you want to do them both, you're more than welcome. doesn't matter if you're fast, slow, if you want to walk, run. We've got options for everybody. You can bring your dog, bring your family, strollers. All these things are welcome. So we're looking to be as inclusive as possible with this particular meetup. If you are local to Austin, obviously, we'd love to have you on a routine basis. But if you are visiting and want to meet up with me, that is a great spot to do it. Uh, Also, if you want to support the show in a non-monetary way, 
Liking, sharing, subscribing on your favorite podcast platform is a great way to do it. When you share stuff on social media, like, share, and subscribe on your favorite listening platform, it helps me grow the podcast. If you are interested in any type of coaching support, whether it be one of my pre-made plans or working one-on-one with me, I have a bunch of different options related to both of those as well as consultation options and email collaboration options for people if they want to work with me on whatever they are training or preparing for at the moment. You can find all the information to that at zachbitter.com. At zachbitter.com, you can also subscribe to my newsletter, which is a uh, Uh, an email that I'll send out. Um, At this point, I've been doing them very seldom, but I will likely be increasing the frequency of those as we head into the new year. But that can be signed up for at zachbitter.com as well. If you want access to these podcast episodes that are ad-free audio and early release, meaning they go up as quickly as I can get them put together after we record, you can access those on the show Patreon page. So If you want to check that out, you can head over to zachbitter.com forward slash HPO. That page is also a spot where I put links and details to all the previous episodes. So if you're curious about the show notes or links that we talk about in that particular episode, it's a great spot to connect to see that as well as find the different audio and video uh, options that are available for the podcast itself. Finally, If uh, one of the show sponsors has a product that you think would be useful in your lifestyle, you can let them know that you heard about them from the Human Performance Outliers podcast. All the sponsors for the Human Performance Outliers podcast can be found at zachbetter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Links to all of this will also be in the show notes as well if it's easier for you to click over to all those links I've mentioned in this intro by going into the show notes. This episode's sponsors include Buy Optimizers Magnesium Breakthrough Supplement and Bond Charges Sleep Mask and Blue Block Glasses. Bond Charge is a holistic wellness brand with a range of products that help you navigate the modern environment in a better way. They focus on things like circadian rhythm and optimal sleep routines. I've been using two of their products this summer. These include their 100% blackout sleep masks and their blue light blocking glasses. Good sleep hygiene like a cool temperature environment, pitch black darkness, and a quiet environment can go a long way to help you stay asleep and maximize your nighttime rest. So personally, I like a consistent routine I can replicate whether I am at home or traveling. Being able to replicate my routine as close as possible makes it easier to consistently get a good night's sleep regardless of whether I am home or traveling. I use the Bond Charge sleep mask to make sure I have the same 100% blackout regardless if I am at home or traveling. The material on the Bond Charge sleep mask is comfortable, adjustable, and allows me to sleep on my back or sides without discomfort. The soft padded eye cups allow you to open your eyes while wearing the mask. I also spend a lot of time every day staring at computer screens, phones, and tablets while recording, editing podcasts, answering emails, and writing my coaching plans. I use the Bond Charge blue light blocking glasses while trying to stay an arm's width away from the screen when possible and refocusing my eyesight every 20 minutes. This helps minimize discomfort from blue light and glare from staring at screens all day. If you want to check out either of these products and the rest of the things that Bond Charge has on their website, you can go to bondcharge.com forward slash HPO and use coupon code HPO to save 20% off your order. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com forward slash HPO and use coupon code HPO to save 20% off your order. Bond Charge ships worldwide in rapid time and has easy return and exchanges if you are not satisfied. All right, folks, let's talk a bit about magnesium. Magnesium is abundant in green leafy vegetables, nuts, seeds, legumes, and whole grains. Magnesium is also an antagonist of calcium in the body and is required for vitamin D synthesis and activation. As such, magnesium deficiency can inhibit the potential benefits of vitamin D supplementation. If your way of eating does not include many magnesium-rich foods, or you have these but still experience low levels of magnesium, you might want to consider Bioptimizer's Magnesium Breakthrough. 
Supplementing with magnesium can have its downsides, one of which is it can also be a laxative, which could just exasperate the problem you are trying to solve. Magnesium Breakthrough is my favorite magnesium product because it is the only full spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can actually absorb. And this month, Bioptimizers are including free bottles of their full line of digestive health products on select orders while supplies last. That means you are getting free products to try that will support your digestive system. Having an optimized digestive system means less energy trying to digest foods and absorbing more nutrients from the foods you eat. This special offer is only available at magbreakthrough.com forward slash human. Visit magbreakthrough.com forward slash human and enter code human10, that's H-U-M-A-N-1-0, for 10% off any order. Bioptimizers also continues to offer its impressive 365-day money-back guarantee so you can test it out risk-free. Links and details can be found in the show notes or at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. All right, let's jump into that first one. So this first one, we're looking at just specifics to training for a course that has a component that includes climbing and descending in it. When folks have access to terrain similar to the course itself, generally speaking, I advocate for prioritizing course-specific terrain, especially in the back part of the training plan when you're building out your long run so that you're doing the race-specific stuff closest to the race itself. And with one of those components being the course itself, trying to mimic the terrain as closely as possible. Some of the reasons for that is it's just going to match the mechanics that you're going to use on race day. And it's also going to allow you to get in better tune with just how intensities are going to feel and vary from certain certain terrains to others. So if you do have access to terrain specific to your course, the thing I like to do is, especially with the long runs and when you get into the long run development, start moving your train your, your training towards that train. So if we're talking about a race course that has a lot of climbing and descending or any climbing and descending, trying to match that course profile as closely as you can is the move. And if you can get close to the actual percentage grades that you're going to see on those courses, that's that's even better. So one thing I like to do with some of my coaching clients and myself, if I'm doing a course like this, is we'll actually look at the course profile because sometimes you need to dive into it a little bit. You can find just like the averages. You can look at just the net gain and loss over the course of the distance that you're going to race and come up with an average and try to target that. That's sort of like going through the first layer. Another way to do it is look at it even a little closer and just determine whether the course has a lot of variety. And by variety, I mean, do they have some climbs that are quite steep while others are more moderate and others are more gradual? So you might find a course that has like some spots where it's kind of a gradual five to 6% grade climb for a while. You might have another course or later in the course, you might have real steep, like 20 plus percent grade where most people are going to be hiking up that section. And then you might have something even a little more in between that closer to like 10, 12% grade. If you have a situation like that, you may want to try to find situations where you're able to target that variety over the course of long runs, or if it's not in one run, spread out over your training plan so that you're actually working on the specifics and the mechanics that you'll be doing on the grades that you'll do on race day. If you don't, you can go pretty long ways with what I said before, by just looking at the average and kind of targeting that and uh, kind of dial in your your training and your mechanics and things like that on a relatively similar to what you'll be, be seeing on race day. So if you don't have access to that, there are some things you can do to best prepare yourself in able to have the best day you can out there. The first thing I usually like to share with people when we're looking at this type of a scenario is don't beat yourself up over it because it's not a variable you can control. And if you can't control the variable, all you're really going to all you really want to think about is what is the the best path forward. And in reality, regardless of whether you have course specific train or not, getting really fit for the intensity and the, the duration at which you're going to be out there is going to take you much further than any of the other little things that you do along the way. The little things are good, but the big mover, the big stone, so to speak, is going to be just getting fit and following the proper training protocol for the intensity that you're going to be doing out there. So don't beat yourself up too much. 
Uh, if you don't have that course specific profile, if you really want to do that race, definitely still do it. And uh, you'll be able to find a way to prepare for it. What I like to do with these situations is, as the question kind of implied and actually asked, is a stepper a good substitute? Uh, the answer is mostly yes. So for these type of situations, I actually like incline treadmills a little better than stair steppers, mostly just because you have more variety with those. With an incline treadmill, you know most of them are going to go up to like at least about a 15% grade and some upwards to 40% grade. So if you have that sort of range on a treadmill, you can really start to match the inclines of the race itself. And in some cases, if you have a course similar to the one I first described, where you have a variety of different grades that range from like steep, like 20 plus percent to rather uh, le much less steep, like five to 6%, you can actually practice those specific inclines. If you do have a course that has that variety and the, that treadmill can get about as precise as possible. So you're you're just as good almost in that scenario as you would be if you're out there on the course itself, minus the variance and kind of terrain in terms of like, you know, technicality and undulations that you can have on a trail versus a treadmill. The stair stepper is going to be kind of more fixed. You're going to have that steeper incline kind of consistently. So it's going to be useful, but it's not going to be exact in terms of the mechanics that you would use on race day. What you'll likely improve still, though, would be like mechanics like hip flexor strength that where you're going to have to drive your knee up to go up an in incline a little bit more. Or the fact that when you're going up a steeper incline, you're going to be on your toes, your balls, your feet a little more. So you're going to be engaging your muscles in a way that's at least semi similar to what you would maybe doing if you're going to power hike up up a climb or something like that. So these stair steppers and things like that can be used. And those are going to be useful tools for you if you have access to them and don't have access to course specific train, but it's going to be just for half of that equation, which is the uphill side of it. The other thing you want to consider, and this is actually the part that sometimes beats people up the most is the downhill running side of things. So when you start running downhill, even though the effort is really easy or feels really easy compared to running uphill or even running flat. What you end up doing is you end up creating a situation where you're loading up your quadricep muscles with eccentric contractions. And these eccentric contractions are essentially like your muscle contractions that occur when a force applied to the muscle exceeds the momentary force produced by the muscle itself. And this results in a forced lengthening of the muscle tendon system while it's contracting. And the repetition of this sort of eccentric contraction is going to lead to something that you, that calls delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS. And what happens a lot of times with courses like this is people will notice at the end of the race, they may be pushed a little too hard or weren't properly trained for the eccentric load that they were going to take on and their quads feel like they've been blown up by the end of the race. And they find themselves having a very hard time going downhill and oftentimes maybe walking downhills when, when that, those are the opportunities to really make up some time. So it's something you want to consider if you don't have training is how do you kind of get some of that eccentric load? Uh, you can get eccentric contractions at a higher rate just by running faster. So this might just be something where you end up doing a little more or stretching out a little bit more of your speed work type stuff earlier in the training plan or count that as uh, something that would potentially be a weakness component for you since you don't have access to that those downhill running terrains the way you would if you were on the course itself. Uh, there are some strength work stuff, which I'm going to go through in a bit. One thing I do usually tell people is most places are going to have some sort of hill that you can, even if it's really, really short, that you can at least get short bursts of downhill running and engage that eccentric contraction a little bit. So whether it's like an overpass, a sledding hill, or just anything you can find that's going to give you a bit of a decline that you can run down and maybe do repeats on, if you have access to that, maybe try to prioritize that especially as you get closer to the race and you're trying to kind of tune your muscles to the types of mechanics that they're going to be doing specifically on race day. When I'm working with folks like this, uh, I also try to prioritize eccentric lower leg movements in the gym versus maybe what we would normally do from a lower body strength stuff. So we just lean a little bit more into those eccentric movements on lower leg, leg day and we may prioritize lower leg strength a little bit more than say we would 
in a typical plan. So when we're looking at strength work for endurance athletes, the majority of the benefits, if we're just looking at lower body are going to come with like one session per week. Uh, you can do more than that, but you do want to be mindful of the scenario in which you're using this supplementary activity and it's potentially creating issues where it's lowering the quality of your running your primary activity. So do be careful when you're starting to add strength work with lower body stuff that you're not compromising your workouts. The way I like to try to minimize or eliminate this scenario from happening is if we're going to do say two lower body strength sessions per week, which is where we probably end up trying to go if the person did not have access to downhill running and we're trying to make sure that they're going to be prepared for the eccentric contraction component of their race is we're going to pair those workouts with their higher intensity workout for the week or workouts in this case, if they're doing two for the week, the reason we're going to do that is we're going to try to make sure that we're keeping those harder days hard. So we're not in a situation where I have them do something hard with like, say short intervals one day. And the next day they have a rest day from running or an easy day running, but then they're going to the gym and they're hitting those light lower body leg muscles hard in the gym and essentially creating an environment where they're getting two different types of hard in a row and kind of missing the goal of recovery. What we're going to try to do is we're going to try to pair those up and we're going to try to pair them up in a way that's going to be the least intrusive on their running performance. So that might be something like doing the speed workout or the higher intensity workout of the week first during the day. And then after or later in the day, doing the lower body strength session and then giving themselves a little bit of flexibility with that following day being an easy day, since you did ask quite a bit out of your lower body for that day with a higher intensity workout of the week, as well as a lower body strength. So then even if you're maybe a little bit sore, a little bit tired from that stimulus the day before you have a built-in rest recovery day or an easy run day where we're not looking to get you into uh you know, moderate higher intensities out there while you're running. And we're just focusing on recovering and recouping, uh, everything for the next session. That's going to be a priority session. Some of the movements that we're going to focus on, uh, include like an eccentric lunge. So an eccentric lunge, basically while moving through that lunge movement that a lot of runners are probably familiar with, if they do any sort of strength training, focus on going very slow during the lowering phase of the lunge. So five seconds is a good starting target. And when you're doing that lowering motion of that lunge, giving yourself about five seconds to lower down into it before kind of returning back to that upright position. When, when your form is kind of mastered, when you've got that all dialed in and you know, you're not doing anything negative through improper mechanics and movements, an option to increase the difficulty. If you find yourself needing to do that is by adding some weight to that lunge with things like dumbbells, or you can even incorporate some jumping lunge movements, which are going to just heighten that eccentric contraction component of that activity. This is another application for a weighted vest. If you want to have your hands free, but still add some weight to that movement, I think weighted vests are great tools for this sort of thing. So if you have one of those or are looking to incorporate one of those in your training, this is a, a good opportunity for that. Another movement is dumbbell side lunges. While moving through that side lunge movement, focus again, going very slow during the lowering phase of that lunge. So about five seconds is a good starting target for that. Incorp you can incorporate a step or a box to step down from. This will kind of amplify or increase that eccentric portion of that movement if you do that. So start out without that and then gauge kind of how your body feels after that. But if that becomes something that is becoming quite easy for you, you need to increase the difficulty a bit to maintain the progress. Adding that step or box is something you could consider. Next is skaters. Skaters is a movement that's a little bit more dynamic version of a side lunge. You want to kind of perform this as like a small jump to the right, followed by a small jump to the left while moving through a side lunge movement. So you're really just kind of like increasing that eccentric portion or eccentric component of that side lunge. So this might be something that you don't necessarily put in in the early stages of strength work if you're new to that. Or if you are going to put this in on the early stages, maybe just be a little more mindful about how much of them you do the first time, engage how your body responds to that. Strength work is going to be the same as training where we're looking to kind of micro stress you, where we're giving you just enough stress so that you're going to make some improvements, but not so much that we're taking future workouts off the table. Next would be a reverse dumbbell lunge. This movement is similar to a forward lunge. 
but with the movement going backwards into that lunge position versus forward. So while moving through this backwards lunge movement, again, focus on going very slow during the lowering phase of that lunge. Five seconds is a good target once again. Finally, another one I like is single leg box squat. So for this one, you want to keep one leg elevated off the ground in a straight formation with your arms reached out in front parallel from the floor and then lower towards the box or bench with a squatting motion. And that's going to be that final movement that I really like to kind of add for some of these eccentric movements in the strength in, in the gym. So hopefully with that sort of stuff, you can kind of close that gap a little bit on your lack of course specificity. If you do have specific course stuff, it's not a bad idea if you have a lot of long downhill running in your you know, on your race to kind of include this as a component of your lower body strength. I think if you do have access to that downhill stuff, though, that's going to be the most direct way to do it, to work on the specifics that you'll use. And you'll probably just have a little more flexibility in your lower body days to include some different types of lower body strength movements if you want. All right. Next question is what is the best way and how often should you baseline your fitness? So this is kind of a question that I think you want to look at through kind of like two angles, which is like, how do you kind of first start out with a fitness test that's going to allow you to properly execute the workouts that you're focusing on? And then once you have that information, how do you kind of progress through your plan in order to use it optimally? So for this type of stuff, like the first thing I think you want to do is you want to kind of outline what is going to be your focus points in training throughout the entire plan. So if you're working on a plan the way that I typically do, which is weaknesses and important things, but least specific to race intensity earlier in the plan. And then as you move through the plan, you get more and more specific with the things that you're doing up until that final kind of peaking phase where you're going to be focusing primarily on the specifics to that race distance and intensity, you want to be thinking about these things because those are going to kind of highlight when and where you're going to do these specific workouts, which is also going to determine kind of what you're measuring or what fitness marks you're trying to measure for. So if we break this down kind of simply, what I like to do is like, let's say we're working on short intervals. If you're working on short intervals, you can do kind of a field test or a fitness test in which you're going to gauge the intensity at which you'll do your short intervals at. And that's going to be kind of that first way to kind of baseline your fitness or determine what it is you want to do with those short intervals. Uh, I like a lot of times I like to use like a Cooper test, which is a 12 minute essentially time trial where you're running as fast as you can for 12 minutes, as evenly paced as possible. Uh, it doesn't have to be a race day setting, but if it is, if it's a race that kind of gets you in that general time frame, you can use that. Uh, you want to take the intensity that you produced for that time trial and try to replicate that intensity as close as possible when you're doing your short interval sessions. From there, you can gauge progress by just watching over the course of weeks and maybe months, depending on how long you are going to be targeting this intensity to uh, see that you're making improvements. So if you can control for things like weather, and the course that you're doing this on, that gives you a little bit of an advantage in terms of eliminating or controlling variables that could potentially uh, cloud the, 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 the view of or the analysis of whether the workout's going the direction you are. If you can control for those things, then you're looking at a situation where you want to keep or maintain that intensity you experienced during that 12-minute Cooper test throughout the entire development phase of those short intervals what you should notice though, is a reduction in your pace at that intensity. You can use things like heart rate to help you with this too. If you capture that data during that Cooper test, I do find it difficult in a lot of cases to get accurate measures of heart rate quick enough when you're doing especially very short intervals. And it oftentimes is a high enough intensity. Like my short intervals tend to be described as a nine out of 10 uh, perceived effort. So it makes it a little more difficult to be like glancing at heart rate monitors and then actually responding to it. Because if you get a faulty reading or it's just not responding quick enough, like how do you necessarily make those adjustments when you're doing a workout that's at that high of an intensity, it makes it kind of difficult. So I think you really do want to lean, lean into the perceived effort for this one. And as long as you're able to, to focus on that and kind of bring in that information and replicate it on your short intervals, then you'll be in a position where you can watch the pace and those short intervals drop over the course of say four to six weeks as you're going to be developing that 
that specific intensity. And then you can do this for all the other intensities too. If you're going to start targeting something like your lactate threshold or an intensity that you could sustain for roughly 60 minutes in a race day setting, you can do a field test. Or if you go into a lab and get your lactate threshold tested and get heart rate data, experience certain intensities and things like that, you can go and replicate your long intervals and tempo runs at that intensity. And just like those short intervals gauge over the course of time, whether you are improving on your pace at that same intensity, because really what we're looking for is for you to get faster at the same intensity. That's the sign that we're heading in the right direction. And this can even be used when you get into a phase where you're developing your long run and you can watch it. It's going to be at a lower intensity, but you're going to watch your pace improve again at that same intensity. And when you start getting into longer intervals, uh, steady state stuff, and long runs and stuff like that heart rate, I think becomes a little bit more of a potential tool that you can use alongside perceived effort because you're more likely going to get an accurate reading that you can actually make use of during the workout itself. But just like the short intervals, I think post workout analysis is where heart rate can potentially be a useful tool to use as well to pair with things like pace at intensity that you are going to acquire over the course of putting together some of these workouts and making sure that they're going in. So to sort of uh, finalize the answer to this question too. Uh, I don't know that you necessarily need to be continuously baselining fitness the way you would with like a field test that you'll do in the beginning throughout your plan. I think it's a good idea to, to do those things at the start of a new plan or a new build as you're maybe coming off an off season, confirming if your fitness is where your fitness is at relative to where you ended last time when you first ended those sessions and headed into your last race. Uh, Last question, how or what to eat for high mileage, but avoid gastro gastrointestinal issues, especially if I'm constantly hungry and bloated. Okay. So this is a really good question because I think a lot of times when people start diving into nutrition and healthy foods and things that, that they're supposed to eat or supposed to include into a balanced diet, a lot of times this type of stuff ends up skewing towards things like weight loss goals and satiety, things that aren't necessarily the goals of somebody who is putting in a lifestyle of high energy output. You know, you're training for your ultra marathon or your marathon or any endurance race, and you maybe are doing workouts sometimes where your, your energy output is 50% or even 100% and further above your resting metabolic rate. And in a situation like that, some of these healthful foods that are more geared towards satiety and potentially weight loss or weight maintenance can become a problem because they tend to sit in your stomach longer. They tend to make you feel full, potentially bloated. And if you have to work out to do after a meal that is comprised of foods like that, that could just be counterproductive for the progress you're looking from a performance standpoint. So for these type of situations, I like to actually come up with a list of foods that are a little more high energy, low volume, which just means they have a very high calorie count for the weight or size of that item. So you get a lot of bang for the space that's going to fill up your stomach is what we're going for there. And then from there, it almost doesn't matter whether you're someone like me who kind of follows a little bit more of a low carbohydrate diet. If you're someone who follows a strict or ketogenic diet, or if you're someone who's following a moderate or high carbohydrate diet, because there are foods that kind of fall within that, those categories on both sides of those macronutrient sides, fat or carbohydrate. You can find carbohydrate sources that are high energy, low volume. You can find fat sources that are high energy, low volume. And I think you definitely want to have a list of those for those days where you're having a big energy output, but you don't want to feel like you're always full throughout the course of the day or heading into that workout itself. And that alone is probably going to help a lot with some of those gas gastrointestinal issues. Uh, and it, if you're feeling constantly hungry and bloated, it could potentially help with the bloated side of that. Uh, sometimes I feel like if someone is feeling constantly hungry and bloated at the same time, that can be a sign that they are potentially getting maybe a little too aggressive with things like fiber. So their stomach is full, but their energy demand is not met. So their body is sort of giving this mixed message where I'm full, but I still need more fuel because you just had me run X number of miles and I want to train again tomorrow type of a situation. So this is where I think you do want to maybe just check to make sure you're not like greatly exceeding the recommended values of things like fiber and getting a little too aggressive with some of those bulkier foods. 
This could also just be a situation where someone has like a food intolerance or an allergy too. So this is potentially a, a, a scenario in which if in your off season, you may, may not be a bad idea if you have any indication that you have a food sensitivity or allergy to do something like an elimination test where you remove a lot of the foods or all of the foods essentially that have the higher rate of con- potentially causing things like gastrointestinal issues allergic reactions and things like that, or cause bloating more often than not removing those from your diet for like, say four weeks or 30 days or something like that. And then reintroducing some of those that you want to kind of bring back potentially one at a time. So then you can assess whether it's one specific food or, or another. So you're not just necessarily getting rid of everything and then never having it again, because one food within a grouping of foods that you tended to eat together happen to be causing these sorts of issues. So that's another option that you can potentially do to uh, kind of ease up some of that stuff. But that's kind of my, um, my, uh, my go-tos with that. And with these three questions though, if there are other avenues within these questions that you'd like me to dive deeper into, feel free to shoot me a note. Or if you have topics or questions that you'd like me to address on a future episode, feel free to reach out to me. You can get a hold of me by sending me an email to hpopodcast at gmail.com or reach out to me on one of my social media channels. You can find me at Zach Bitter on Instagram, at ZBitter on Twitter, and at ZBitter Endurance on Facebook. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that this episode's sponsors include Bond Charge and their Sleep Mask and Blue Block glasses, as well as Buy Optimizer's Magnesium Breakthrough Supplement. You can find links and discounts to that in the show notes and at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. Hey folks, thanks for checking out this episode of the podcast. For those of you who are regular listeners, you'll likely know I'm also a professional endurance athlete and coach. If you're looking for a little extra help with your training and programming, I do offer individualized coaching options where you can work directly with me one-on-one. I'll personalize your plan and even scale it up to email collaboration and regular consultations. You can also access either of those on their own if you just want to contact me as you're navigating your fitness journey. I also have some ready-made plans. The ready-made plans follow my coaching philosophy and they scale from five kilometers all the way up to 100 miles and come in three different levels. So whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced, I've got something for you there. And most recently, I also just added a strength athlete's guide to endurance program, which will help someone who is primarily a strength athlete who wants to either do an endurance event for the fun of it, bolster up their cardiovascular fitness, or just try something out, try something new. So those programs are built to be able to supplement a strength program. So you won't have to give up on your gains in the gym while you're going after some running or endurance related fitness goals. You can find all those things on my website at zachbitter.com. Thanks for checking out this episode.